Well, I do welcome you all um, to the Eucharistic Convention. I always regard you as the holy old crowd that come along on a Friday night. You could have been at Eden Park, but <laughs> we're all here. And I thought um, the 21st celebration of the Eucharistic Convention, I suppose we're very conscious of Monsignor Cronin and um, John Porteous and Bill Moore and the team that have worked for 21 years to produce the convention. And I was thinking, well, what's new about the convention this year? Having 21st birthday, it's Anzac Day, it's the first year that we've had Pope Francis. Um, as always, it's Divine Mercy Weekend, but it's also the weekend when um, our two new saints are going to be canonised, Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul the Second. And I thought, I'd just like to reflect a little bit on those two great popes. First of all, isn't it amazing that we're actually here over this weekend, we'll be celebrating the canonization of two popes who've lived in our time. Sometimes we can get very worried about what's going on in the church. Think, you know, um, but isn't this amazing that we've had such saintly popes in our time? This is almost unprecedented in the history of the church, that one after another, and I hear that Pope Paul VI, the great, I suppose the architect of the council, that he is to be beatified soon too. Plans are underfoot for his beatification. This is a huge grace for us, the church in our time, that we've been led by such wonderful, saintly, holy leaders. Pope Francis, when he was talking about the, the forthcoming canonizations, he, he spoke about John the 23rd and his courage and vision in calling the Second Vatican Council. And when he spoke about John Paul II, he spoke about him as the missionary to the world. Remember JP too, he went everywhere. So just um, a few little thoughts about the popes, these two popes. John XXIII was elected pope in October 1958. Some of you will remember that. I can. He was 76 years old. And um, I can remember, I was, of course I was very young at the time, but I can remember um, people said, oh my, OMG, <laughs> we've got a 76 year old Pope. The Cardinals couldn't make up their mind, we've got a caretaker Pope. You know, 76 year old, he won't rock the boat. Um, it'll be gently as it goes, you know, <laughs> until, um, they can find someone who's really going to put a bit of life into the church. Well, what a surprise we got. Right from the beginning, there were indications that it wasn't going to be um, business as usual. Firstly, he chose the name John, which no pope had chosen the name John for about 500 years, so that was a bit different. And then, um, I suppose, uh, even the shape of John the 23rd, without wanting to be personal, um, you know, past the 12th, he'd been long reigning Pope past the 12th, very tall, very thin, um, looked a bit sort of um, Spartan, if you like. Well, John the 23rd, if you've seen photos of him, he was short and he was round. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was, um, and uh, past the 12th was very formal, you know, like you knew he was the Pope, and he acted like the Pope. John the 23rd was um, sort of a bit more informal, and he had a spark of humor about him too. He'd come out with the occasional little unscripted line. And um, it's a lovely story told when he was, um, soon after he was elected Pope, he was vi visiting the hospital of the Holy Spirit, Santo Spirito Hospital in Rome. And the mother superior came to greet him and she said, Holy Father, you're most welcome. She said, I'm the superior of the Holy Spirit. And he said, Reverend Mother, he said, you have done well. He said, <laughs> he said 
<laughs> I'm just the vicar of our Lord. You know? <laughs> On another occasion, John the 23rd was asked, um, a reporter said to him, how many people actually work in the Vatican at the moment? And he said, oh, about 50%. <laughs> But it wasn't past the 12th style, but it was John the 23rd. Now, within a few months of being elected, he called the council. And that was a big surprise, because I suppose through history, councils tended to be called if there was a crisis. And there didn't seem to be a crisis. And when he was talking about the aims of the council, John the 23rd said that he called the council for two key reasons to pro promote enlightenment, edification, and joy for all the Christian people. And the second reason he called the council was to extend a cordial invitation to the faithful separated from the church to participate with us in this quest of unity and grace. So he wasn't calling them to come home or to see, see the truth and join us again, he was inviting them to join us in this quest of unity and grace. The point was that it was all positive, it was all upbeat. And when he gave his opening address at the start of the council, the first three words in Latin, we've been singing a bit of Latin tonight, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church rejoices as she considers her mission of proclaiming the gospel to all nations. John the 23rd set the tone, and the tone was one of joy and hope. And, and this thing of let's all work together to build up the body of Christ. John the 23rd. 20 years later, in October 1978, uh, the Pope from Krakow in Poland, the, the, the cardinal from Krakow in Poland was elected, John Paul II, 58 years old, not 76. And like his predecessor, he chose his name from the two popes of the Vatican Council, John and Paul. He would be John Paul II. They say that shortly after he arrived, uh, he got a nickname in the Vatican, he became known as Hurricane Wojtyla because he was like a tornado. JP2, what do we remember about him? 104 trips abroad, visiting 129 countries and traveling the equivalent of the Earth to the Moon three times over. He certainly got around. Missionary to the world, Pope Francis called him. He's the first non-Italian Pope for 455 years. He spoke to more than 17 million people in his Wednesday audiences. He issued 14 encyclicals and 14 apostolic exhortations, almost one a year. In fact, more than one a year, he'd see, he was a teacher to the church. He canonized 482 new saints and beatified another 1,338. He made more saints than all his predecessors put together. What is his legacy? World Youth Days. Duke and Alton put out into the deep. He, he exuded hope, didn't he? Crossed the threshold of hope. JP2 made us proud to be Catholic. But most especially, all these saints, a lot of people said, look, he's making too many. But I think that was exactly what John, John Paul II wanted to do. He wanted to get across the idea that we're all called to be saints, that there are thousands of saints. And he needed to tidy up this idea we have of being saints, because often we can think of saints as perfect people and think, well, I'm not perfect, so I'm not a saint, and I wouldn't want to be either. <laughs> Who wants to be like that? The point, though, is that the saints are ordinary people. They're not perfect. They're saints because they're faithful. They're faithful to their calling to follow Christ, to serve Christ. 
In the great Easter Gospels, we see that Peter and John and the other apostles, they're all transformed, but they're the same people. On Easter Sunday morning, Peter goes racing up and barges straight into the tomb. It's exactly what we'd expect of Peter. That's the way he was. With his strength, was a weakness, but that doesn't matter. We find in the Gospel the Easter appearance they've gone fishing, and poor old Peter doesn't seem to be much of a fisherman. You know, they've been out all night and caught nothing till the carpenter sat and told them which side to put the net on. But, but the point is, the apostles were human as we are, but called to be saints. And that's, ex that's the great message JP2 leaves for us. We're all called to be saints, to be holy, all in different ways, like flowers in a garden. Of course, we've all got our faults, but Jesus can turn our faults, our dark spots, if you like, into beauty spots. He loves us as we are. The theme for the convention this year is Viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. As we move into the convention, as we celebrate the Mass this evening, let's ask our blessed John the 23rd, soon to be saint, and blessed JP2, soon to be saint, uh, to pray for us and to support us with their prayers as we in our turn seek to serve Christ, our Lord, our Saviour and our King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Two plans are underfoot for his beatification. This is a huge grace for us, the church in our time, that we've been led by such wonderful, saintly, holy leaders. Pope Francis, when he was talking about the, the forthcoming canonizations, he's he spoke about John the 23rd and his courage and vision. Canonized Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul II. And I thought I'd just like to reflect a little bit on those two great popes. First of all, isn't it amazing that we're actually here over this weekend? We'll be celebrating the canonization of two popes who've lived in our time. Well, I do welcome you all um, to the Eucharistic Convention. I always regard you as the holy old crowd that come along on a Friday night. You could have been at Eden Park, but <laughs> we're all here. And I thought um, the 21st celebration of the Eucharistic Convention, I suppose we're very conscious of Monsignor Cronin and um, John Porteous and Bill Moore and the team that have worked for 21 years to produce the convention. And I was thinking, well, what's new about the convention this year? Having 21st birthday, it's Anzac Day, it's the first year that we've had Pope Francis. Um, as always, it's Divine Mercy Weekend, but it's also the weekend when um, our two new saints are going to be... Sometimes we can get very worried about what's going on in the church. Think, you know, um, but isn't this amazing that we've had such saintly popes in our time? This is almost unprecedented in the history of the church, that one after another, and I hear that Pope Paul VI, the great I suppose the architect of the council, that he is to be beatified soon 